does this work? Okay. Thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here also to be with my old friends uh, Hilary and Todd. Just one correction, Hilary. That story was true. The problem was that students were annoying me at NYU. I was lucky enough to get many students who didn't know each other. So I so that you don't wait for office hours to put your names. You put your names there on your grid so that you know each takes 20 minutes. And then since they didn't know each other, I filled it myself with invented names. So I went to the movie theater. Let's go take time to do your work. As you know, for me, to be frank, university is a nice place without students. <laughs> okay, let's nonetheless do some serious talk. What I want to provide today is simply a couple of examples of practicing the old half-forgotten art of the critique of ideology. The shortest definition of what critique of ideology is was, I think, perhaps provided by Paul, the one from the Bible, who in Ephesians 6, 12 wrote, listen, I was trying to talk to read this there. This is Paul speaking. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against leaders, against authorities, against the world rulers, cosmocrators in Greek, of this darkness, against the wonderful expression, the spiritual wickedness in the heavens, end of quote. Or, to translate it into today's language, our struggle is not primarily against concrete corrupt individuals, but against those in power in general, against their authority, against the global order and the ideological mystification which sustains it. What then is ideology? When are we in ideology? Let me give you an example from my own public life. During a debate with Bernard-Henri Lévy at New York Public Library a year or so ago, uh, Henri Lévy made a pathetic case for liberal tolerance. Something like, would you not like to live in a society where you can make fun of the predominant religion without uh, uh, the fear of being killed for it, where women are free to dress the way they like and choose a man they like and what they love and so on and so on. While I made a similarly pathetic case for communism, with the growing food crisis, ecological crisis and so on and so on, um, is there not a need to find a new way of collective action which radically differs from market as well as from state administration? So what happened? The irony of the situation was that when we both stated our case in such abstract terms, we both couldn't but agree with each other. What should I say? No, I want women to be oppressed, not to marry. <laughs> and even, Levy, uh, even Bernard Henri Levy, a hardline liberal, anti-communist, ironically remarked that if this is communism, what I said, even he is a communist. Now, this mutual understanding was the proof that we were both needed in ideology. Ideology is precisely such a reduction to the simplified essence which conveniently forgets what comes up with it as the price to be paid. The, let's call it background noise, which provides the density of the actual meaning of a statement. This is why, for example, I claim you get now in our media, newspapers, TV, all those charity ads, you remember, some usually a black child or a, or a native child from Guatemala, from Africa, which I don't know, crippled, twisted, and so on, and then comes the message, something like, uh, something like, uh, you can make a difference for the price of a couple of cappuccinos or whatever, <laughs> change the kid's life for the better. Why is this ideology? Because again, in abstract, of course, my God, we should all be doing it. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it, I claim, is a concrete message in it, which is, if we read it a little bit cynically, you who are lucky to live relatively safe lives and so on and so on. I know you feel bad because of the hunger, the horrors and so on in which you even in a not direct way but indirectly participate. We offer you a simple way out. For the price of a couple of cappuccinos, 
you can even feel well for it and you can forget about it. Like, the message is that you, I claim, we pay charity, charities not so much to help those out there, but to make sure that they remain there. That they not come. Or another example of ideology. Uh, most of us probably are buying uh, organic food. Now, in itself, this is, of course, okay. But ask yourself deeply, why are you really buying this? I don't think you really believe that all those half rotten apples which cost twice the <laughs> normal, we all love normal, genetically manipulated apples and so on, that they are really any less poisonous. Maybe they are. But I don't think this is why we buy it. There's a certain reflexivity in it. We buy organic apples because it makes you feel good. I am our mother earth is in danger. I am <laughs> part of a wonderful movement to do something. It's a sense of faith activity. I think uh, and, uh, doing something without paying any serious price and so on and so on. So the, the first conclusion here is, you know, every, not only ideological, every field of meaning, or more specifically, every space of rules which regulate interaction within a certain community, from large national communities up to families and so on. I think that the rules in such a space are always, what you call them, two-level rules. You have the explicit rules, do this, don't do that, you may do this, and so on. And, this is for me crucial, you always get Rules which, a kind of a second level rules, rules which tell you how to deal with the explicit rules. This is why, give you a popular example, okay, today is no longer popular, uh, when ordinary people still thought that those from the upper classes have true manners, and they try to learn these manners, you have, you know, all those courses, we can teach you how to behave among the elite and so on. Why do you always fail in, in learning those rules? Because you do learn the rules, but you do not learn the unwritten rules, which tell you how to violate the explicit rules. If you are a member of any community regulated with such rules, you know that to, to truly be in, you must not only follow the rules, but there is a very codified way, nothing contingent about it, of how to softly here and there Violate, violate the explicit rules in both directions. A, there are rules, prohibitions, which are literally meant not to be respected. Like, you are simply an idiot if you follow the rules. <laughs> now, this differs from different cultures. In some cultures, like pay the taxes and so on, if you don't try to avoid paying taxes, you are considered an idiot and so on. Or, especially in sexuality, for example, most of the prohibitions, the standard prohibitions, at least the conservative patriarchal ones, are basically half hidden injunctions to do it, but do it discreetly. And it would be wonderful enough, but you don't have time to do it, to show you how ideology functions at this level. How official ideology is, are not only the explicit rules, which then you are allowed a space for, for, for playing a little bit within the resist, undermine it. Official ideology is the entire space of what is explicitly said and the implicit. So, before I give you a couple of examples, just also the opposite case which I find even more interesting. Uh, especially at universities, I don't know how it's here, maybe you are a, a, a big, uh, big exemption, but... Uh, uh, Everywhere where I was, I encountered much more interesting the opposite example. Things that you are not only allowed to do, but even solicited to do, on condition that you don't do them. You know, to cut the long story short, you are given a certain freedom, but God help you if you take that too literally and you actually do it. The mystery is here, we don't have time to go into it, the mystery of appearance. Why don't those in power simply directly tell you you should do it? Why do they play this game of maintaining the appearances? For example, let's take a harsh totalitarian regime 
Soviet Union in the 1930s. I don't know if you know that in the Soviet Constitution of 34 or 35 when Stalin won, uh, not only was there guaranteed, it says bombastically, Soviet Union guarantees its citizenship, the right to organize a political party. It even says that the state has the duty to provide any group of citizens who want a political party with means to do it, with offices, with newspaper and so on and so on. Of course, if you just try to do it, you were arrested. Why? Why this rule of appearances? And are we aware to what extent even our daily lives are penetrated with this, para with this paradox paradoxical condition? What is politeness? Politeness is precisely a complex network of making offers that you know they will be rejected. The example I use all the time. Let's say an older guy who has money, I don't mean a, a, a friend of mine, but just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, invites you to dinner. It's clear absolutely to both of you that he will pay. Or she. But uh, isn't the usual ritual, at least in my country, I don't know how it's here, that, you know, when the bill check arrives, for a little bit, you have to insist. <laughs> now, yes, I know what you will say. And yes, it did happen to me. Once I insisted a little bit to... Look, okay, you can see that so on. But, you know, what's the mystery? You see the mystery? The mystery is that you both know that, that he will pay. But you both know that your offer, or mine in this case, to pay is in a way hypocritical. But we must go through this ritual. Or, I mean, there are. I cannot even cover all the examples. And then we come to more mysterious examples of this soliciting pleasure, prohibitions which soliciting. For example, let me just take an obvious example, one of the great masterpieces of Western civilization. I hope you saw the movie, The Sound of Music. <laughs> oh, I don't have to engage in the boring exercise of telling. Okay, if you know the movie, you know probably which scene, at least I am even now shocked at what kind of obscenity this scene really is. If you remember a little bit less than half into the movie, Sister Maria, who gets the crash with the Baron uh, 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 Pontre, uh, uh, escapes back to the monastery. She is in love with the Baron and cannot stand it, and so on. There, she still desires the Baron, whose children she was serving, and goes to the mother superior and tells her, like, what should I do? I still have sinful desires. Like, she goes there with the plea to be properly punished so that she will control her desires. No, like, I don't know, put me on fasting, whatever. And then comes the obscene moment. I hope you remember it. When, instead of admonishing her, the, I really couldn't believe it, the mother superior starts to sing a song. <laughs> remember which one? Climb every mountain and so on. <laughs> Almost literally, go back, seduce, and screw the guy. <laughs> and I think this is how, if you really read a certain type of church ideology, you read the lines, they are not telling you no sex. They are telling you effectively accept our superficial rules, play, lip, pay lip service to them, and your sex life done discreetly will be even better. I think they know how they are doing it. It's an entire culture uh, constructed in this way. Maybe this is, but I doubt, more typical, I doubt, I believe, for Catholics than for Protestants. You know, this idea of doing discreetly and, and everything is pardoned and so on and so on. So uh, another example, I repeat it, but it's from a small unknown book of mine, so I hope you don't know it, which I find perfect. I go to another movie which I most sincerely like, I hope you saw it, uh, uh, Casablanca, of course. You remember two thirds into the movie, just a small scene, Ingrid Bergman in the middle of the night comes to Humphrey Bogart to reach cafe and of course to get to ask for those famous visas for Portugal. <coughs> and then something happens. They start to talk, remembering their love affair in Paris 
year or two ago, then they embrace, then a fade out. We see for two or three seconds the tower of the Casablanca airport, just the light turning around, then we jump back into the room where they are no longer embraced, but it just continue the same conversation. What's important here? Well, the important thing is, of course, the stupid vulgar question, did they do it or not? <laughs> that is to say, those two seconds and a half, are they only, uh, are they only here to mark the passage of real time, or are they <coughs> here to signal the goal? I don't know, half an hour, however. <laughs> so much that it's not clear what happens. The movie rather gives you signals, a whole series of signals which point first in the direction they did do it, then in the direction they didn't do it. <coughs> it's consciously contradictory. First, notice that, uh, that, uh, notice that afterwards they are smoking. I hope you know this, that case told Hollywood rules in the 30s and 40s, because explicit sex was prohibited. After a couple embraces, if you have a fade out, and afterwards, if you return to smoking, it was a quite, quite unambiguous signal that there was sex. And a whole series of other, probably, like even that funny primitive statue of the tower of the airport, whatever. But then you have the whole series of signs that they didn't do it. Like, the same conversation seems to go on, there is no bed, no rattled surface, everything clean and so on and so on. So I think the movie consciously plays a double game. The message is, I know you have dirty desires, but I will allow you, as if the movie talks to you, addresses you, I will allow you this, to play this hypocritical game. On the one hand, I will make you safe from any reproaches from the moral ideological agency. If Imagine ideology as an agent asking you, how, how do you dare to watch a certain movie? You say, look, nothing happens, we just talk and so on. But at the same time, I will give you very specifically all the series of signals so that you can do all your dirty imagination and so on and so on. I don't know if you know, but there is a short story by an author, I forgot who he was, who wrote a short story again called As Time Goes By which focuses precisely on the paradox of this scene. It's a 20 pages short story where first is the beginning of the scene, Inger Bergman arrives. The last couple page is the conversation we hear. And in between 15 pages, extremely open hardcore of what they were doing. <laughs> the short story does even something really nasty. It reinterprets in the terms of hardcore pornography, some of the sayings that we know, these legendary sayings from the movie. You know, we all know, uh, 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 we all know this famous Humphrey Bogart phrase with this lady, uh, here's to you, kid. You know how it that happens? In the middle of lovemaking, he gives her, her his, his penis to her mouth and says, here's to you, kid. <laughs> Some uh, 
cards and so on. I did an experiment. <coughs> I showed that photo to a friend of mine who was at some holiday, didn't see this photo. And I asked him, what is this? He told me, when in New York, it sounds like some <laughs> off-off Broadway avant-garde. <laughs> <laughs> You know, again, our army, Yugoslav army, ex-Yugoslav army, was even worse, but for you, you know all these military rituals, fragging, the obscenity of songs, uh, this is what always fascinated me. For example, this so-called, I think, maybe I'm wrong, they are called marching camps. You know these songs that Marines or other soldiers sing while marching, on training, and which are very interesting. They combine open vulgarities, uh, 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 brutal obscenities with nonsense rhymes. Like, okay, an innocent one, I think it's from the movie Officer and Gentleman. Something like, I don't know, but I was told that Eskimo pussies are rather cold. Total nonsense. <laughs> but again, my point is this is not just something which happens by in a close military community. That's the, the point of true identification. When you want to learn to analyze how a certain closed community functions. Don't look at the explicit rules. Look at this, as it were, secret uh, rituals and so on and so on. And again, please, don't accuse me of America bashing. If anything, what happened to me or what I was witnessing in ex yugoslav army, it's too much to say here. <laughs> much further. Okay, so let me go on. The next point I want to make here is that this is why, you know, when you analyze a community, when you witness something that we may call spontaneous transgressive outbursts, like, or transgressive behavior, when you say, oh, enough of it, and you explode in whatever way, I think we should not take this as a spontaneous outburst in contrast to rules. No, this so-called spontaneous outbursts are absolutely even more maybe also regulated by rules. They are not a matter of spontaneous enjoyment. No, they have to be learned. The more transgressive, hedonistic they appear, they have to be learned. Let me just take two, three supreme cases. Smoking. How, maybe you do remember, I don't because I'm a madman, not because uh, I didn't, I never smoked in my life, but don't take me for a crazy guy, not because I wanted to remain poor, because I just don't like it. I don't know. But all my friends told me, and I in the same thing, you know how it usually happened when you were first seduced if you were into smoking? Usually it was a kind of a small transgressive initiative experience, you know, like you are going to elementary school, some friend tell you, you know, this is what others do try and so on. And I mean it's always the same story. First you start coughing, you didn't like it, uh, it's disgusting. Then you literally have to learn to enjoy it as part of the initiatic <coughs> ritual. Again, it's the same with drinking. Everyone who tries whiskey for the first time, the first <coughs> reaction is always, it's bitter, it's disgusting. Then you learn you have to enjoy it. And it's clear that to enjoy it, if you, if you drink for pleasure, you, you don't drink whiskey, my God, you drink some stupid fruit. <laughs> At the deepest level, it's not pleasure, it's some kind of a more, some kind of a transgressive perverted duty. I mean, if you want to do pleasure, masturbation is much better. <laughs> so what I would say is that, uh, uh, is that, uh, uh, you see, this makes the whole of culture. How you obey the rules of all those transgressive carnival adults, uh, uh, adults, whatever, and so on, and so on. Incidentally, as an amusing remark, I think the same even goes for music lovers. For example, I love classical music, and I have many friends who love, but love it. And how do you signal that you are really in part of a, an elite circle? It's not by, if you follow the commonly accepted judgment, you appear an idiot. The way to do is to take a great, I'm not giving you instructions, take a great composer, but ignore his masterworks. Like if you say Beethoven, I like the Ninth Symphony, I like the late string quarters, you are a barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> a lesser known, but there is one piano piece 
nobody knows from the middle age, and this is the last <laughs> Play this game of, like, uh, I don't know, with my good friend Fred Jensen and some others. We even wanted to do a book, we just didn't get enough collaborators of playing this game with Alfred Hitchcock's films. <laughs> the idea was each of us should select, each of us should select um, a, uh, a Hitchcock's film, which is obviously a failure, <laughs> and play the game, ah, oh, but this is the true master. <laughs> <laughs> Fred's selection was stage fright, that failure from 48-49 with Marlene Dietrich. Mine was even the lowest you can go. Uh, uh, Topaz, that anti-communist uh, uh, drama, whatever, from, uh, uh, from the 60s. So this is, uh, that's complication. So if we return from this short detour to my basic point. So we take into account these complications. How does ideology function today, especially with regard to the claim that we live in post-ideological era? I claim that, and I will try to explain why, ideology today appears as its own opposite, as non-ideology, as the reference to the core of our human identity beneath all ideological labels. This is how it works in art, in politics. You can be sure you are in ideology when somebody says, listen, let's forget about all the stupid political, religious labels, ultimately, are we not ordinary human being? We all share the same fears, the same passions, and so on and so on. Uh, to give you an example of what <coughs> is false, the best example I can think of is a book recently translated into which was a tremendous bestseller, first in France, then in Germany, now here also. Uh, Jonathan Mitchell, Le Bien Veillon, I think the translation is the kindly one. So it's uh, slightly too long, almost 1,000 pages. First person narrative of a Holocaust, of a Holocaust, <coughs> a mid-level SS officer who did it all, but of course, in a consciously provocative way, the book presents him as a normal, warm human being like all of us. He has his fears, he's sometimes disgusted, you see all his doubts, fears, and so on and so on. And of course, the book does not justify him, but the, 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 the insight of the book is a deeper one, I think. It is that, you know, Hannah Arendt, already made a similar point as was right. When you are witnessing terrifying acts, don't fall into the trap of thinking that behind the acts you will encounter some kind of a demonic entity, a superman of evil. <coughs> you know, ordinary beings with all their fears and so on. You know, everybody, as we put it, has a human side. Stalin loved her daughter, Hitler liked to talk to children, giving them chocolate, whatever, and so on, and so on. We are all humans. And here comes my next conclusion, which I think I will try to show immediately why it has even political implications. Uh, if there is the, a most basic lesson of psychoanalysis, it is that what we usually refer to as the wealth of our inner lives. There is nothing authentic about it. This is constitutively a priori almost a lie. You know this famous postmodern deconstructionist, whatever definition, anti substantialist definition of human identity, in the sense of we are nothing but stories we are telling ourselves about ourselves. I think it's not quite true, because we are telling these stories. But these stories are fundamentally lies to obfuscate the reality, the reality of what we are doing. What do I mean by it? You remember the, uh, the saying and allegedly deep thought, which I think was pronounced in, uh, by a partisan of the Middle East dialogue. It sounds so deep. Listen, an enemy is someone whose story you have not heard. It sounds very deep, no okay? like I stigmatize you as an enemy because I wasn't able to listen to you. I just terrify you as a monster. Then if I listen to your side of the story, I see you are human like me, you have your dreams, your 
fears and so on, and I see you as a human being. This is all very nice. It has a limit. The limit is what? Well, we reach this limit when we simply replace the general term enemy with a concrete name. Would you also say Adolf Hitler was our enemy because we were not ready to hear his story? No, the answer is this. His story was just a lie which he made to justify and at the same time avoid the horror of what he was doing. And this is incidentally almost the most difficult thing to do and the most tragic even when you <coughs> analyze a certain ideological constellation. You know, uh, the, for example, I recently read the book, I forgot who wrote it, I bought it at some of the uh, book sites, uh, The Nazi Ethic. No, it wasn't meant as a second. The book did something that was absolutely crucial to do. It looked at how did the Nazis justify to themselves what they were doing. And of course you find a very sometimes very beautiful narrative, full of almost I can say authentic <coughs> insights and so on and so on. But again, the truth is not there. That's on what I insist. It's not that when I want to judge you. The rule is, I should look deep into you, I should try to understand what you thought you were doing. Of course I should, but I will not arrive at any fundamental truth in this way. I will rather arrive at something that I tempted to call the fundamental lie. The script <coughs> that you construct to yourself. Uh, this is why we have all these horrible examples. Take the architect of the Holocaust, uh, 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 Reinhard Heydrich before he was killed in Prague in 42. You know what's so shocking reading, uh, reading the biography of this guy? Do you know that in his spare time he was meeting with three other French officers of SS. He was a very good violin player and they were playing in a string quartet, late Beethoven's string quartets, which are maybe one of the top tops of the classical music. Now, what I tragically claim is that uh, you cannot say, oh, but it has been non attentive No, that's very difficult to accept. Maybe he played them with the real authenticity, blah, blah, and nonetheless he was able to do it. And okay, I will not repeat here my old examples, but I think many of them even more tragic. For example, uh, in the West, it's my old story, maybe you don't know it. Uh, did you read all those Huxley uh, great eminent? It's a wonderful historical research into uh, early 17th century French politician, priest, Père Joseph, Father Joseph. He was a counselor to Cardinal Richelieu at the time of the 30 years war in Europe, which devastated Europe terribly, 1618 to 1648, between Protestants and Catholics. If there is a guy who can be retroactively isolated as the origin of Nazism is this guy, believe me or not. Because what he did is that he concluded a pact between uh, France and Protestant Sweden against Catholic Austrian Empire just to prevent the unification of Germany. And he succeeded, which is why Germany delayed its constitution as a nation state, which was the ultimate condition of First World War and then Second World War. So, again, the meanest politician, ordering tortures, poisoning, prisons, whatever. Uh, but, now comes the horrible thing, which fascinated all those facts. In the evening, metaphorically, after doing his dirty work, he wrote the most beautiful uh, mystical meditations. Absolutely at the level of who are our, the biggest hits, Saint Teresa, and so on and so on. And this is what bothered all those hacks. Is it possible? How could a guy who was obviously an authentic mysticist, how could he have been doing that? Huxley thought it's not possible, there must have been something false, not only in his perfect mystique, but also in uh, Christianity itself, for maybe this so Huxley thought Zen Buddhism or Yen Buddhism is better. I'm not saying it's worse, but I'm saying it's not even better. It's not better. Again, read the book to which I refer always, uh, uh, it's a guy called Brian Victoria, who is himself a Zen Buddhist Zen at law. He looks at how the Zen community in Japan, around 10 videos of them, I think, 
related to uh, Japanese war imperialism in the 30s and 40s, attack on China and so on. What he noticed is that they were all justified. Not large majority. Not only this, so not only supporting it, but actively justifying it. For example, one, a guy whom many of you maybe know because he was popular when we were young, in the hippie times. D.T. Daisek Steitaro Suzuki, the great popularizer of Zen in the West. Yes, in the late 30s he was writing texts where he not only justified Japanese aggression on China, he even tried to provide through Zen Buddhism instructions to how to cope with the act of killing. His idea was that for us ordinary people with a minimum of decency, you know, it's not so easy to kill. Like, we can dream of killing, but you have a concrete person in front of you, it can be difficult to stab the person. <laughs> so he mobilized the entire Zen machinery, and he said, this happens only if you remain caught within the illusion of false reality where you know the story. You think you are the agent, you believe in substantial reality, but he says, if you reach the level of Satori, of Buddhist enlightenment, then things appear in a different way. If you are still caught into the limits of your false self, then you experience it like you are there and here I am now stabbing you. This is the story. But then he says, if I reach enlightenment and see the vanity of substantial reality, then I can experience the same scene in a totally different way. Something like, I'm for nothing in it. I'm a pure observer. I call, not even I call. Here is my hand moving around in an impersonal dance, and as a part, as a part of the same dance, your body gets stuck into it. I'm for nothing in it. And then, don't misunderstand me. I'm not blaming Suzuki. He was authentic. The lesson is just, I don't see any continuity as it creates any necessary link between, first of all, it's between our inner experience, authentic as it may be, and the story may be the social consequences, the core of what we are doing. I claim that fundamentally, our innermost identity, in the sense of the stories we are telling ourselves about ourselves are not the truth. They are even, as a rule, a lie. In this sense, I claim, this withdrawal from external reality in the sense of let's look into the depth of your personality, you as a concrete human being, is false. And so let's go to give you another example, to the very opposite end of uh, the Nazis, and I'm not claiming in any way that they are the same, quite on the contrary. But to see how, of course, at a much more modest level, level, but nonetheless, we find something similar, for example, in today's uh, Israel. Let's look at the movies. Did you see the last two Israeli films, which were a big success, about the 1982 Lebanon war? Ari Folman's animated documentary, Waltz with Bashir, and Samuel Maoz's Lebanon. Lebanon is especially typical here, I think. You know, it presents the experience of an ordinary Israeli soldier in the Lebanon war, when he was in a tank penetrating deep into Lebanon. And almost the entire movie is shot from the perspective within, inside a tank. All the horrors, the claustrophobia, and so on and so on. I think this is ideology at its purest, because under the pretext of Forget about ideology, war is horrible. We need that horrible experience, nonsense. You know, all the historical background, what was he doing there? Who was he killing? Children and so on. It all disappears. All of a sudden, it becomes the story of your inner suffering, fears of your inner experience, and so on and so on. So it's pretty sad to report how Israeli army, I know because I was there, I have there many friends, I was often there. So IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, play this game endlessly. For example, uh, they don't present themselves as superheroes, like, you know, ooh, one battalion of us can take Cairo in one afternoon if, if we want, and so on. No, they always emphasize uh, war is not in our genes. We are human like you. We are afraid. We I remember long interviews in the movie, which I think is the theology, it is purest, you know, Brock Langsman, Shoah. 
but you know he did later another movie called Tafal, which is the name for Israeli Defense Forces. Endless interview along the model of Shoah with Israeli soldiers, their memories about the 73 Yom Kippur War. And it's all about this concrete experience. They, they tell how they even urinated, they were totally scared, like an endless variation of we are human. But I claim this precisely allows you to obliterate the political consequences of what you are doing and so on. Uh, let me give you another example which I must say really shocked me. Uh, when I was in Israel, they reported of a strange incident. Uh, a group of anti-terrorist soldiers entered an apartment where they suspected uh, that uh, the, an alleged terrorist is hiding. They found only his family there, wife and children. Among the children, a daughter, of course, terrified that soldiers breaking in, started to cry, and the mother, to calm her down, uh, uh, called her by her name. Her name and big And then one of the Israeli soldiers breaking in discovered that he has a daughter with the same name. And of course, he pulled out his wallet and so you see, mother, I have the same dog, I have the same name, you see the message, oh, we are human, and so on and so on. But I think in that object, in that situation, this was an obscenity. You know, to emphasize in that sense humanity. So again, uh, now, so that you will not say that I'm only taking, as it were, uh, Nazis and, God forbid, to confuse them, Israelis. I will also give you an interesting example the, uh, from the opposite side politically. Uh, uh, you know that in today's Cuba, they have a certain even relatively, at high level, quality detective novel. Some, the biggest, their biggest export name is a writer called Leonardo Padura Fuentes, who writes police procedurals, four of them or even five are translated, you can get them in better bookstores. Uh, the hero is Mario Conde, a uh, police commissar in today's Havana. The books are so critical, I mean critical, at least in the sense of presenting all the misery of today's Cuba. They are a lost generation, uh, misery, hunger, prostitution, nepotism, and so on. So that I thought, my God, it would be nice to visit this guy in a nice villa in the suburbs of Miami or what. I was surprised to learn that no, he is, uh, he is, he is in Cuba, and not even as a half dissident. He is totally accepted, supported by state media, and so on. So I asked myself, what's going on? And I think it, it is from the standpoint of their interest. Cuban authorities are right in supporting him. Because, you know, in spite of all the criticism, the basic message at this human level of, of Leonardo Padura is what? It is, okay, we screwed it up, it's a misery, we are a lost generation, and so on. But the true patriot hero takes this with bitterness but heroism. Don't dream about Miami, we are from here, we should heroically go on here. You know, this totally without, without any apparently in a totally non-ideological way, like cut the bullshit of socialism and so on. But nonetheless, you know, be faithful to you, stay here, don't escape into dreams, and so on and so on. It's, I claim, a, a, a really, really very refined mode of ideology. Where will you find a similar ideology? Now we go to more crazy workers, a little bit on politics. Maybe you know this part, then I will go to other examples. My first example would have been, uh, did you see the movie, I did it six times, because of my, my uh, Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> That's the ideology of the right. I think it's a perfect, almost clinical example of how we function in our societies. Uh, if you saw the movie, you know, the big fat, Kung Fu Panda called Po uh, 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 wants to become a, a warrior, uh, sorry, Panda called Po wants to become a Kung Fu warrior and succeeds. But okay, what is that? the movie moves at two levels. First, you have all these Orientalist, Western Buddhist uh, elements, you know, faith, choice, fidelity, hero, and so on. All these the Buddhist, religious, military background. At the same time, you must have noticed it how the movie is full of most the commonsensical, brutal 
humor jokes at its own expense, at the expense of, of this ideology. It makes fun continuously of these Buddhist wisdoms and so on and so on. But that's something extremely interesting, which is that in spite of all this ideology, this pseudo Buddhist mystique survives. You can make fun of it, but nonetheless it functions. And this is the mystery. This is, I think, how beliefs function today. Nobody really believes. If you ask anyone, do you believe? Everyone will tell you, you can see, are you crazy? What should they believe? But beliefs, first of all, they socially function. We have the paradox of beliefs which, as it were, circulate. Nobody believes in them, but they function. The one who first provided this formula was, and I appreciate her for that, was the Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir. You know, when she was asked, do you believe in God? You know what she said? It's a nice formula. She said, uh, uh, she didn't answer. She just said, Jewish people believe in God, and I believe in Jewish people. <laughs> you know what this means? This is not the usual Stalinist logic, where your reasoning is uh, you know, ordinary people need to believe. No, I claim nobody has to believe, and belief functions. How does this function? Let's take the most simple example. Imagine uh, Christmas. Of course, you don't believe in Santa Claus. My God, you have to provide yourself the presents. <laughs> but when somebody asks you, do you believe in Santa Claus? Uh, you will probably say, no, I just pretend because of my children, not to disappoint them. Now, if I ask alone, not where they in front of you, your children, I'm sure they will say, of course, I don't believe. I just pretend not to disappoint my parents and <laughs> to get the presents. And it goes on endlessly, I claim. So you can get, you see, uh, Belief functions as element of a social network. It functions except although even if nobody effectively in the first person believes. And this message is wonderfully formulated at the end of Kung Fu Panda, where Kung Fu, <coughs> the Pope, the Panda, looks for the secret ingredient that would make him a hero. In his ordinary life, he just helps his father who runs a restaurant where they make a special soup, noodle soup. And father claims that he, there is a special ingredient to that soup. And at the end, the father tells him the city, there is no special ingredient. It's only you. To make something special, you just have to believe it's special. And then he discovers it's the same for becoming a warrior. This means precisely what I was saying. There is no special belief, no special quality, it functions even if you know that there is nothing. It functions if you, as it were, follow it as if it functions. This is how our beliefs function today. At the cynical level, you can laugh at everything. But I claim that nonetheless beliefs function. Like, I'm again sorry if I repeat a story which I'm repeating all around already for 10 years. Uh, Niels Bohr, quantum physics, probably you know it, made a wonderful comment. Uh, he had a country in the a house in the countryside of Denmark, an old wooden farmer's house with above the entrance door a horseshoe. I don't know how it is here. In Europe, a horseshoe <coughs> above the entrance doors is a superstitious sign preventing evil spirits to enter the house. So a friend, another scientist, visited him and said, but wait a minute, are you stupid? I mean, why do you have this? <coughs> do you believe in it? Niels Bohr said, of course not. Then the friend asked him, but why do you have it here? You know what Niels Bohr answered? I, of course, I don't believe in it, that this really prevents evil spirits. Gender. But he said, but I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. Nobody believes in democracy, blah, blah, blah. But we somehow accept it at the social level that it works. So again, before we dismiss fundamentalism and all that as crazy people who believe Let's first set the things straight. I claim that we believe in a way more than ever just in this more impersonal, in this more impersonal way. From here, one, one could have go on in analyzing Hollywood as a path towards uh, our ideological constellation. Like there is another picture which is, I think, pretty crucial in Kung Fu Panda. 
No lady, no girl, no love interest. All you have in the universe of Panda is this mystical wisdom and then a kind of, a, what they call it, oral, anal, pre, pre-sexual primitivity. The, the drive of the hero, the, the Panda, is not <coughs> sex, power, is eating. He eats like a pig. It's kind of oral, anal economy. It's so typical, I don't know how many the authors, they are not idiots, they are aware of it. That, uh, you know, he is called Po, P-O. I mean, in German, Po is a common term for S, no, for... I mean, so, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, sexuality is excluded. And I don't know what this means, but... Did you notice how in many recent films, and I'm not saying this simply means less sexuality, I don't know what it is, Hollywood starts to violate its own old rule of, how should I call it, of uh, creating the couple. Uh, for example, this was what was so mysterious in uh, Da Vinci Code. You know, already years ago, a friend of mine, friend, sorry, British ch- Lacanian psychoanalyst, Daniel Winter, told me something wonderful. He told me, you remember X Files, if you watch some of them. He provided a wonderful formula for X Files. He said, why do all these things happen out there? You know the formula, the truth is out there. Here an alien, there an alien. He says, to cover up the fact that nothing goes on here between the two of them. You know, no sense. So all this has to happen because, and I claim it's exactly the same formula for the Vinci Code. At least the movie. Poor Jesus Christ has to screw Mary or what to cover up the fact that they don't do it. <laughs> it's not this. Okay, it's between Tom Hanks and uh, who is the friend girl that I don't like, uh, whatever. <laughs> the chocolate girl, because they put it not. No sex here. Uh, and then it goes further. In movies, even more than in the novels, take the earlier novel, uh, Angels and Demons, the way it was made into a movie, if you saw it, again, no sex. Although, the girl is quite, quite if you allow me a sexist remark, quite nice, nice but uh, <laughs> nothing happens, no sex. And then if you read, I did, I almost killed myself. It's uh, <laughs> novels, and I measure him, uh, Dan Brown, by his own standards. It's so bad, this lost symbol. But you remember there, it's just another older lady, there is not even a minimal, a minimal sexual tension there. I find this very strange, what is happening in, in Hollywood, that they, are, that they are moving in this direction. Because I even found the same, did you notice that the same happens for the first time in entire James Bond, in the last James Bond, Quantum of Solace. No sex. Just at the end they discover they are both two separate or whatever. So, uh, why am I saying this? Because one of the standard formulas of Hollywood, which I developed in now from Italy, <coughs> is that whenever you have a big dramatic story, it can be about the end of the world or whatever, it's always enframed by the logic of creating a couple. Like, it goes up to 2012. The subtitle of 2012 could have been how? A young, what is he, failed writer, John Cusack, lost and regains his wife, and so on. To, to, to make it, to go further, even two couples are created. The daughter, Tandy Newton, also gets a good color guy, so that. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, this formula, how it gradually disappears. And it plays a, a, a crucial role, this formula. What I'm saying is not that simply we should obliterate all the historical background, fighting the Nazis and so on. But it's that what makes the film, as it were, attractive, the cause of our desire, is this apparently marginal feature that all the official topic of the movie, which is in the foreground, you know, how to break the Nazi code, is generated our interest because it's always in this kind of a dialogue, constant dialogue which is framed, which is the enigma of sexual relationship, the enigma of a woman, and so on and so on. Okay, let me now go on to my final, or slowly approaching the end, uh, <laughs> element, which is uh, what 
if we live in this so-called post-ideological era, where we say, forget about big ideological phrases, be authentic, be who you are, enjoy life, and so on, or as the, we put it today, because I think our predominant ideology today is more some kind of a enlightened hedonism, which is decaffeinated Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama popularized, you know, be true yourself, realize your potentials, and so on. I think uh, what is the reason for it is that we found ourselves in a stage which can be called cultural capitalism. I think something did change with capitalism after 68. Capitalism somehow integrated all the critique, critique of consumerism, alienation, and so on, and functioned in a new function in a new way. Now, the two dimensions which were still now opposed on the one hand, the dimension of your consumerism, I want this product to enjoy it and so on, and the dimension of caring for society, let's call it the, the, the altruistic, humanitarian, ideological dimension, they are more and more combined. How? Well, if you visit Starbucks, you will immediately notice it, because Starbucks is maybe the company which most directly exploits this. They are masters. You know what they are doing. All the time they are bombarding you by something like, when you buy a cappuccino with us, you don't buy just a cappuccino, you buy much more, and they enumerate it. Hey, you buy an authentic community. They, know, they openly manipulate Starbucks, this ideological cliche that in our societies we no longer town councils or public places, they are no longer here, we are just isolated individuals. The idea is we will provide an ersatz community for you. Then they go on. We only grow our uh, coffee beans from organic, we only buy from organic farms. We give money there to educate, to bring water to them. And so, you know, the idea being all this, I cannot but call it uh, uh, semantic density. Like, you don't just buy a coffee. You are made aware that you buy a whole ideological experience of caring for others and so on and so on. Uh, uh, I claim that, uh, uh, that, we, that this is absolutely crucial for today's capitalism. That this is where cons consumerism tries to recuperate its own opposite. You know, it's no longer I do this, I consume, but I have to do something else to do something good. No, if they offer you a much better choice for consume and you will at the same time act as a humanitarian, caring for mother nature, caring for others, and so on and so on. This formula reached recently almost its climax with two cases. First, uh, maybe you've heard about it, Thomas Shoes, a company founded in 2006 for shoes. Their formula is one for one, as they call it. They claim for every pair of shoes you buy with them, Another pair of shoes will be given to, again, some starving children, I don't know where, and so on and so on. It's a wonderful formula. It gives you, as it is, you may engage in consumerism because the more you do it, the more also those who are excluded profit by it. Or another absurd Coca Cola, uh, sorry, Pex, recently started uh, publicity uh, uh, with the formula I quoted. Pepsi was always about refreshment, but what if, instead of just refreshing people, Pepsi helps to refresh the world? So the idea is that uh, when you buy a Coke, you get the right to vote, to send your ideas about what to do to help people. And then when these ideas will be gathered, they will be able to put to vote, and you will be able to choose which idea, helping starving people here, the preserving of nature there will be will be put will be put to use. So even have even you even have the as it were the element of democracy here. But what are the further consequences of it? Here with Pepsi, of course, Pepsi plays to the end the logic of what, what, what one cannot call but uh, uh, the logic of freedom of choice. And with this, I would like to conclude because I think that the fight that we have now in the United States, this ideological fight about healthcare reform, is an important fight. Because what it focuses on is precisely the 
freedom of church. And things are complex here. Okay, do not misunderstand me. I'm totally on the side of those who are for the reform. What I just wanted to say is that effectively, uh, you know in what sense things are getting complex today. In the good old days, the main argument against the ideology of free choice was this vulgarized Marxist part. Yes, we are given choices, but only the unimportant choices. Pepsi or Coke or whatever. We are not given the real choices. This is up to a point true. But I think in some sociologists, like the German one, Ulrich Beck, in his well-known book on the risk society, they, I don't agree wholly with them, but they nonetheless pointed out something. And how the status of choice, risk, catastrophes changed today. It changed in what way? In the sense that today we perceive as risks in our era of new uncertainties, not, all, not simply something which will hit us from outside, like a gigantic asteroid or whatever. We are more and more aware that there may be risks which we are generated or threats by our own activity. So, you see, the problem is not so much that we don't have a choice, but that we have a choice, but, and I don't think here, I am critical of the big companies, that we can simply put all the blame on the big companies, but the situation is simply not transparent. Okay, basically, of course, I accept the, the global warming argument, but things are so, you know, we are, it's not that we have too much, too much power, okay, humanity as such. We, the consequences of our own activity are impenetrable to ourselves. We are effectively, we are so strong that we can even change nature, but we are not aware of how are we doing. For example, I, read, I got a message recently from a friend from China who told me that even this big earthquake, you remember a year and a half ago or when they were in the Sichuan or the province inside the big earthquakes. And they now more and more, they don't make it public, but nonetheless more and more admit that these earthquakes were probably the product of human uh, activity. You know how? You remember China is building those gigantic three gorges dams or what? The idea is that the gigantic lakes they created have changed so much the <coughs> pressure, pressure on different strata there that they, if not caused, the earthquake at least contributed to it. So again, that's the first element of radical insecurity today. <coughs> and uh, the second point I want to emphasize here is how, and this is again ideology that is purest, how the very uncertainties caused by the gradual dismantling of welfare state are then sold to us as new freedoms. For example, we all know that more and more we are forced to make just one to three years contracts. It's more and more difficult to get a long-term job. But instead of, then we are told, why don't, instead of being afraid of it, why don't you take this as a new opportunity to reinvent yourself every two, three years to make a choice and so on and so on? Or with healthcare, at least in Europe, where we are also slowly, we already had it, dismantling well, uh, healthcare. <coughs> the reasoning is, again, this gives you new choices. This gives you a choice to choose. You know, do you want to spend more and take a risk or do you want to be absolutely sure, spend less, whatever, and so on and so on. This, I think, is ideology that is curious. Why? Uh, uh, because, a uh, little bit, uh, two, three points only, almost old-fashioned Marxist points I want to make here. As it is clear, not only to Marxists, but even to old-fashioned communitarians and so on. You know, freedom, actual freedom of choice, personal freedoms that we all cherish, is something which works only more and more in our complex society only against the background of the very complex network of state guarantees, rules, uh, uh, customs, civility, and so on and so on. Do you know how many 
things has to function in the background so that you have your freedom. And I think that if you approach it in this way, then universal health care, if anything, provides for people much more freedom. In what sense? The comparison I'm tempted to make is with water and electricity. <coughs> I mean, you probably noticed that all of us, maybe in some states or cities it's different, but I think practically everywhere, everywhere you are brutally deprived of the freedom of choice then, no? Where you live, you simply connect to water, to electricity, but most of you would have said, okay, if they rip me off too much, I will protest, but you don't want to say, oh, I want the choice here. And your life would become a nightmare. Certain things should simply function in the background, so that when it really matters, you have choices. Of course, water and electricity really matter. But you prefer having them back there, not to deal with them. I claim it would immensely raise the level of actual choices, freedoms, and so on, if at least a basic health care acquires a little bit of this status. That you know what I mean? You don't have to worry about it. It's in the background. This doesn't mean in any way in what way it should be done, and so on, and so on. So now, really to conclude, once I started a talk with, let me conclude. But what happens when this invisible background disintegrates of institutional guarantees, of customs, and so on and so on? Well, something very sad happens. Something, the first preview of what we can get in a movie which some people whom I know recently made, there is not yet a premiere even, so I'm not even supposed to talk about this movie because some of the people who have, who have made this movie are threatened, you will see the device. It's a Danish documentary, Free Men When Killers Make Movies, made by a small Copenhagen in Denmark. House. It's about a group of ex-killers in, from Medan, Indonesia. It was shot in 2007. In this film, uh, they, it shows a group led by a guy called Anwar Kongo. They were, maybe you don't know, but in 1966, uh, communists tried a coup d'etat there, and then the right wing generals counteracted, and then in the aftermath, there was, people estimated at least around two and a half million of suspected communists, most of them of Chinese origins, were killed. Now, this movie tells the story of one of the group of these murderers. What is so shocking about the movie is that it tells the story in an open way. You know what I mean? Like, the murderers don't tell it secretly and so on. They publicly boast about it. Like, we pride, they say, they, and it's shattering. Like, you see them, who are now rich businessmen, senators, journalists, and so on. They answer all the questions. When they are asked, how did you usually rape women? They describe it. It took them some time to discover the most pleasurable way that usually the girl should be on a table back, and then you ask a friend with a wire right around her neck to hold her down and strangle her slowly, and so on. Then they ask, how did they torture men? They describe was the most practical way, cut off their balls, make the guy swallow his own balls, all that nice stuff. And, and they do this publicly and openly. There is even, at the end, a TV show that really took place in Indonesia on a, one of the state TV channels, which is the ultimate of obscenity that I've seen. In this TV show, the, uh, these criminals are in front of a large audience, ask, answer questions, and so on. And then the moderator celebrates it. Like they ask a guy, how did you torture, blah, blah. And the guy says, oh, I, in this way, it's the most practical way to torture women. And the moderator says, a big applause for the gentleman here for this nice insight, and so on, and so on. It's like a caricature. You, you know, usually this happens to this bad taste leftist dystopias where they imagine some future totalitarian society. It happens there. And the question is, again, how is something like this possible? Because the movie up to a point answers it. Because all the 
Polish guys love Hollywood when they were young, but I'm not blaming Hollywood for them. And the way they were able to do it, they imagined themselves, as they said, James Kennedy and Humphrey Bogart were their two heroes. They imagined themselves as imitating Hollywood heroes, tough guys, gangsters, and so on. Again, I'm not blaming here Hollywood, but I'm also not blaming here the primitive Indonesian culture, like you know those videos there and so on. No, I'm saying that it has more something to do with how the ongoing capitalist globalization undermines our standard traditional ethical ethics <coughs> and creates a certain moral vacuum. And my point is that uh, this is the first battle to be won, as it were. Don't think that ideology doesn't matter today. Precisely today, in our utmost cynical era and so on, we are more deeper in ideology than we ever were. Ideology, again, as I pointed out, it's not only the explicit rules, it's all beliefs that we obey without believing in them, all the obscene implicit rules and so on and so on. And it is very difficult to withdraw from it because you pay the price for it. It hurts, as it were. Which is why, what if you really want to do something today? You should not succumb too quickly to this idea of children are starting, let's do something. Yeah, of course we should, but first of all, first we should change ourselves. First we should put in order our, our dreams. First of all, we should start here. Otherwise, this is for me to put it in very naive terms, the reason of the failure of the 20th century revolutions. I have no mercy for Soviet Union and so on. They won, but they didn't win in the dreams they were dreaming. No, then you end up with what you end up with what you end up here because do not just a concluding variation do not forget how important dreams are let's take the ultimate ideological dream anti-semitism of course we all know and today I claim we leave it so that let me make it okay first nonetheless I want to make it clear where I stand here uh, I still think that anti-Semitism is ideology by excellence and cannot, cannot ever be justified. But that, nonetheless, not in spite of this, but because of this, I think one should absolutely also be critical of what goes on in today's Israel. For example, my thesis is a crazy one here, but I presented it in Israel. That Zionism is the, today's Zionism is the ultimate stage of anti-Semitism. In what sense do I think? He said, yeah, came to him and there was a big public debate in, I think, Jerusalem, <laughs> where I was defending a friend of mine, uh, anti-Zionist uh, Jewish filmmaker, Woody Alon, and then people in the public attacked me, claiming, but listen, you are a famous philosopher, this guy is nobody. Are you aware that this guy just wants to exploit you for money? That this guy really doesn't care? Then others accuse this guy of not being really one of them, Jews. That he's just floating around with no Then I told them, are you aware that you are describing this guy in exactly the same terms the late 19th century anti-Semites, nation state partisans were describing the Jews? They are only for money, they don't really have roots in their community, and so on and so on. Uh, but, uh, okay, but nonetheless, back to this. Uh, uh, anti-Semitic image. You know, it's not enough to say that Jews are not like that. You should fight anti-Semitism not only at the level of facts, as every racism, but also at the level of dreams, fantasies, and so on. You know, because if you accept the debate at the level of facts, are Jews really like that, and so on, it's over, okay? You will achieve nothing. Imagine debating with somebody in Germany in 36 if there the anti-Semitic Nazi image of Jews is true or not. The result will be somewhere in the middle. Like the anti-Semites accused Jews what of exploiting the Germans. Well, my God, some Jews were rich. So in a certain sense they were exploiting Germans. So all you can say at this level is 
it's not as bad as the Russians claim, but there is some truth in it. Okay, they claim Jews corrupt, seduce, essentially, our German girls. Well, I claim probably it was totally true. And why not? Of course. Anyway. So, you see my point. The true question is not, are Jews really like that? The true question is, why does the anti-Semitic subject need the figure of the Jew? And here I am tempted to repeat Jacques Lacan's wonderful ironic statement when he says um, that uh, when a husband is jealous of his wife, 